Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Limo Raviv, who's presenting work with Louise Pecker and Sadie Hooks on the complexity and simplicity in the evolution of languages across species. And this is the last talk in this session, and then we'll have a plenary afterwards. All right, the stage is yours. Thank you. So I just want to note that perhaps you notice there's a surprise author here. So Louise, who was not on the original uh, abstract submission, she's an expert on animal communication, and she joined our team a bit later in the process. Um, I'll give you an overview in a sec, but for now, I also just want to note that our message is somewhat different from what you may or may not have read in the abstract, uh, much thanks to Louise refining it and making our message much more nuanced. Um, and the revised paper is hopefully uh, will be published soon. So if you're interested uh, in more details, I'm happy to share the manuscript. Just drop me a note here or on Twitter or email, and I'll just share it again. Okay, so, right. So our story begins uh, with the realization that Cedric and I had after the previous Evolang, uh, and that is that at least on the surface, the fields of animal communication and human linguistics have seemingly arrived at conflicting theories with opposite conclusions with respect to the effect of social organization on communicative complexity. So specifically, an increase in group size, so having larger groups, is argued to have the exact opposite consequences on human versus animal communication systems. So while an increase in human population size leads to language simplification, an increase in animal group size is argued to lead to uh, uh, an increase in signal complexity. Um, and we were uh, a bit baffled by this, but what we're going to do today is ask, is this really true? So are, do humans and animal communication systems really show such a fundamental discrepancy? And I do want to kind of, uh, uh, spoiler alert, to say that there's two or key message, and I, I will break it down during this talk, but the main idea is that there's this tension uh, between the field stems from two different uh, uh, problems. The first is a focus on different levels of analysis. So are we talking about grammar-like rules or what we call syntax, or are we talking about signal variation um, or what is, uh, you can think about this as refer to our size. And importantly, while research on animal communication typically focuses on signal variation, research on human language typically focuses on rule-governed grammatical structure, for example, the degree of compositionality or hierarchical structure. And the second problem here, um, that there is an inconsistent use of terminology across fields, and namely, what do the terms simple and complex even mean? Um, this is a really loaded question with lots of disagreement and subjectivity, and it's made worse by the fact that there's actually no widely accepted way to measure communicative complexity in either of the fields. Even within the same field, there is different metrics used and different measures that are used to evaluate complexity, and different uh, scholars often operationalize complexity differently for signals, for example, in the vocal domain or in the gestural domain. Um, so this is indeed a pretty uh, complex question. Shoot, see what I did there? <laughs> okay, so just to kind of give you a spoiler alert, uh, what I'm going to do in this talk is to break down this problem and disentangle these two issues. So basically clarify the terms simple and complex with respect to grammar versus signal variation. And in case you want to snooze for the rest of this talk, this is totally fine. Here's the take home message. So the take home message is that animal and human communication systems indeed show a contradictory effect with respect to signal variability here marked with the red arrow. Um, but they actually display essentially the same patterns with respect to grammatical structure. And here it's in the green arrow. And this is despite the fact that the definitions of complexity and simplicity show the exact mirror pattern. So they diverge in meaning when it comes to grammatical structure, but they're actually aligned for signal variability. Okay, I'm gonna break this down um, a bit slower in the next few slides. So let's dive into this idea. Okay, so as I said at the beginning, at the heart of our reflection lies this kind of alleged mismatch between fields. Um, as group size increases, Human languages have been argued to simplify, while animal communication systems seem to become more complex. So focusing now on the animal communication, and just to illustrate this point, looking at the field of animal communication, one of the most influential hypotheses in the field is called the social complexity hypothesis. This was advocated by Freeberg and colleagues nearly a decade ago. 
and has since spurred dozens of research papers. And according to this theory, and I'm going to use a direct quote now, groups with complex social systems require more complex communicative systems to regulate interactions and relations among group members. So more specifically, this social complexity hypothesis in the animal communication uh, field predicts that animal species that live in bigger groups would display greater communicative complexity compared to animals living in smaller groups. So that's the kind of prediction from that field. But if we switch um, to uh, the field of uh, language science, uh, basically on the face of it, it seems that the exact opposite conclusion is drawn here and when the focus is squarely on human languages. So according to the very popular linguistic niche hypothesis, which was formulated by Lupien and Dale and others around the same time, and has also spurred dozens of research papers, including my own work, um, according to this hypothesis, bigger communities of humans should have less complex languages compared to smaller communities. So if you're gonna put the passages from these two hypotheses and these two fields side by side, it creates an impression of an interdisciplinary conflict of clashing conclusions, such that an increase in community size affects communicative complexity differently depending on which species you're talking about. So if you're talking about humans, bigger community, communities are associated with less complexity, but in all other uh, animals <laughs> except humans, bigger communities are associated with more complexity, more complex communication systems. But yeah, as I said, is this really the case? Is it really true that human and animal communication systems show this fundamental mismatch? And as I said earlier, I think the story, well, we, well, we found out uh, after delving into the literature is that the story is actually a bit more complicated than this. So when looking more closely, we realize that this alleged conflict between fields is partially the result of a focus on different levels of analysis. So the degree of rule-like grammatical structure on one hand and signal variation on the other hand. Um, and the use of the term simple and complex across fields varies in consistency depending on which of these two levels we're talking about. So when discussing signal variability, here, these terms are actually consistent across fields. So in both animal and human communication systems, the idea is that having more variation is considered to be more complex. Um, however, these terms are used in exactly the opposite way when discussing rule-like grammatical structure. So the existence of grammar-like rules for combining elements is considered to be complex in animal communication, but is often referred to as simpler when talking about human languages. So just as an example to illustrate this point, when we talk about human languages, if we think of a linguistic construction that has some kind of internal structure or a clear cut compositional rule for how to combine words or how to combine morphemes, this is typically considered as simpler than a construction that is totally holistic and idiosyncratic or um, irregular that has no underlying structure whatsoever. Um, but when we talk about animal communication, the opposite holds. So animal communication systems that have some syntactic clear rules for combining signals together are often referred to by scholars as being complex systems. But while a holistic and idiosyncratic signal that has no internal structure is considered to be simple. Um, and focusing now on this kind of grammar-like rules, we can ask why is this difference in terminology? What, what, where does this come from? Why did we end up with completely different uh, uh, terminology, use of terminology? And we think that there's two sources for this problem. Um, the first is about memory limitations and the notion of ease of learning. These two concepts are really prominent factors in the language sciences, whereas in animal communication studies, they place their emphasis on other functional aspects. So in particular, evolutionary linguists like myself would typically refer to compositional expressions as being simpler than holistic ones, mostly because they're easier to learn. They're more efficiently compressed into fewer bits. They allow learners to easily derive a set of productive and generalizable rules um, rather than memorizing uh, lots and lots of individual holistic forms. But in animal communication research, memory and how easy signals are to learn, this doesn't really play a role um, uh, in the argumentation. Um, instead, in the animal communication field, the argument is focused on the fact that compositional expressions allow for more 
um, elaborate communication systems that have higher affordances for interaction and for expression. In a way, you can think about this like the notion of complexity relies on this very basic idea that something that's compositional, a compositional signal, consists of many different and connected parts. And this makes it more complex than an individual signal that has no subparts. This is basically the most uh, simple form of signal. Okay. And the second source for this discrepancy is in definitions, we think comes from the fact that terms like complex and simple also carry really loaded social baggage. Um, they invite subjective associations that can be interpreted really differently across contexts and also between individuals. So for some, the notion of simple can be associated with something superior. So simple means more elegant or more optimized or more efficient. But for other people, the notion of simple can be associated with something inferior. So being less sophisticated, being basic, being unrefined. And unsurprisingly, as you've seen in uh, the graph's talk yesterday, these terms like complex and simple have been used in the past to make really potentially harmful and politically charged judgments about the nature of languages used by different communities. So by saying that some languages basically are better than others because they're more complex, as in the case of Creoles, um, which is clearly a very subjective interpretation of these terms. And actually, the same holds for cross-species comparisons, right? So human languages are often considered by animal communication uh, scholars as you know, being better than animal communication systems because our language is so complex. It has all these grammars and all these rules. So it's it's really really these terms are not um, are not neutral. Um, they come with with this with this baggage as I tried to illustrate. Okay. So, but most importantly, I think this is inconsistent use of the term complex and simple across fields actually obscures the fact that in res with respect to grammatical structure, both these fields in fact converge on the exact same pattern. So for both animal and human communication systems, the prediction is that more social complexity or having some increase in group size in this specific case would elicit more grammatical like structure and promote the existence of more compositional rules for signal combination. So actually there's, as I said, an inconsistent use of terminology, but the patterns are in fact identical. And the predictions are in fact identical. Okay. Um, but focusing now on the level of signal variability, um, here the literature on animal communication and human languages are actually consistently aligned in terminology when defining complexity. So as I said before, in both fields, a system that has more cross-individual and inter-individual variation it seems to be more complex. And a reduction in signal variability or consequently a, re re uh, um, a reduction in the total number of unique signals. You can think about this as kind of like a lexicon size or repertoire size. This, as you get less of that, the, sim the system is simpler. If you get more, the system is more complex. So in other words, both human and animal communication systems are more com complex if they consist of either bigger or more heterogeneous um, signal repertoire. Okay. But uh, upon closer scrutiny, it appears that despite this convergence on terminology, the two fields do in fact diverge in their conclusion with respect to the effects of social complexity. So an increase in group size is typically associated with more variation in animals. And this is true ranging from primates to rodents to bats. And all. Um, but an increase in human group size is typically associated with less signal variations. And, 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 I want to say this is at least in the early uh, stages of language emergence, and I'm going to uh, explain what I mean. In a second. So focusing now on animal communication systems, here um, research shows that call referred to our size and vocal variation is positively correlated with group size. If you look at more than 40 primate species, over 20 bat species, there's lots of work on this. So bigger animal groups means more signal variability. And the explanation for this trend is that animals that live in larger groups are likely to be involved in a wider range of interactions with more diverse social partners, ultimately triggering a need to transmit broader diversity of information, if you may, and to express a wider range of emotional and motivational states. So in this sense, large repertoire of distinct signals allows for this flexibility of, and diversity of, of communication. And in addition, more group members 
means that there is, um, you may benefit from accurately recognizing the identity of the sender of each signal. Um, but as the number of individual that you need to discriminate against grows, the more this recognition task becomes difficult, essentially driving selection, selection for um, more variability. So in other words, you can think about this, that having greater signal variability in animal is advantageous for individuation, uh, and the pressure for individuation grows as community size grows. So this is um, the animal communication literature. But in contrast, um, studies on emerging sign languages and human communities suggest that languages that evolve in bigger communities are actually more uniform compared to languages that evolved in smaller communities, despite the fact that these languages are of the same age and evolve around the same time. So for example, a very famous one, the El Sage Bedouin Sign Language, which evolved in a relatively small community, displays a great deal of lexical and sublexical variation. So for the same meaning, the same concept, the exact location and shape of the hand can vary a lot from signer to signer, um, and different signers can use completely different signs to express even very frequent concepts. Um, some concepts were even reported to have up to six different variants in a group of eight people. That's a lot. Um, but in contrast, Israeli sign language, which evolved in a much bigger community um, around the same time and around the same area, actually displays a surprisingly low degree of variability, with, more, uh, with most words having just one single conventionalized form. Um, so although, in a way, the languages of bigger groups could and should be more variable by default, just if you think about that the number of potential variations and innovations is somehow also inherently dependent on how many individuals there are, right? So more people potentially could have more variations. But this actually shows the opposite. It shows a high degree of lexical convergence. And the explanation for this trend is, um, and as was mimicked in my own work, is that members of larger communities are somehow under a stronger pressure to reduce variability and to converge on a shared lexical form, seeing as they're often less familiar with one another, they typically share less common grounds, uh, but they still need to interact and uh, successfully communicate with each other. So here, the focus is that reduced signal variability is advantageous for convergence, not for individuation. So the pressure for convergence is expected to increase as community size grows. So yeah, that's completely different lines of, uh, of argument. Um, one, one can ask why is signal variability then treated so differently across fields? Why is more variability seen as beneficial for animals but problematic for humans? Um, and one likely reason for this may be the reliance on meaning uh, in the domain of human language. So in linguistics, the number of variation is not just counted randomly, it's counted for a specific reference. How many variants does the concept X have? But in animal studies, the number of variations is merely based on distinctive features without any association to meaning. Um, or as I'm going to quote uh, Platts 2019, identifying semantics or meaning in non-human animal communication is probably the most difficult task because of our limited ability to infer the real goals and intentions of non-human animals. So essentially, in the domain of animal communication system, all this kind of uh, the counting of signal variability is done irrespectively of meaning, just how do, how do signals differ from each other. And interestingly, you can think of this problem of detecting meaning in animal communication as also amplifying the difficulty in detecting grammatical structure. So in animal studies, the term syntax in grammar has been used to generally describe any combination of units, okay, even meaningless ones. Um, but in human language, the most classic sense of the term syntax and grammar deals specifically with the combinations of somehow meaningful units, like morphemes or words, not meaningless ones. In fact, this type of animal syntax is clearly referred to as phonology or combinatorial structure in linguistics. This describes the combination of meaningless sounds into a meaningful unit, like a word, right? So what... Uh, this, this kind of combination is not treated as a, a syntax uh, in human linguistics. This means that the terms compositional and combinatorial are actually used as synonyms in animal studies, uh, but refer to completely different levels of analysis when we talk about human language. And this is a, a pretty crucial point. Okay, so I just want to um, summarize uh, everything. So this is what we found. We found that for signal variability, both fields are aligned with respect to terminology, 
but they verge in their conclusion with regard to the affected group size. For grammatical structure, the opposite holds. Both fields diverge with respect to terminology, but are in fact aligned on their conclusions with regard to the affected group size. And as I tried to explain, the reasons for this pattern are diverse and non-trivial um, and, and relate to a, a, an abundance of reasons ranging from subjectivity to uh, the difficulty in detecting meanings and so on. Um, and our main take home message in the paper is that we should actually really move away from these general and potentially inconsistent terms like complex and simple. These can really obscure interesting patterns across fields. Um, instead, we think that theories um, and theories, you know, like even linguistic niche hypothesis and social complexity hypothesis should try to formulate their predictions using very specific, neutral, and descriptive terms. For example, repertoire size, acoustic variability, talker variability, gradation, entropy, there's many more. Um, these can be applied uniformly for both human and animal communication systems. And in the paper, we have a table summarizing all these alternative terms. Um, and how they're used and what they mean. But the idea is to, that using these terms can directly uh, make directly comparable descriptions of findings across species and then promote a more productive cross-disciplinary dialogue between these two related fields that often uh, talk past each other. So that's it. Thank you very much.